Hello, Tom Lavecchia here with the latest edition of the Arm Chair NBA. Today, we have a very, very special guest, Myron Sugarman. Uh, his father was Barney Shuggy Sugarman. I uh, sold and operated slot machines. And this guy knew a whole bunch of people, top ranking members of the Genovese family, uh, La Cooperación, Yakuza Cartel, and more. He lives in Jersey now. He's semi retired. And some of the names that he knew back in the day Longies Woman, Meyer Lansky, Doc Thatcher, Gary Katina, Tommy, uh, Tony Caponegro, Tommy Bully, and more. Myron, welcome to the Armchair NBA. How you doing today, buddy? Oh, hi, Tommy. How are you, buddy? I'm well. So we'll jump right in. Um, let's kind of start with your father. Kind of who was he and what was the organized landscape uh, back then? What was it like? So my father starts, he's Newark, New Jersey, born in 1900. And by the time he's... 20 years of age, you had the beginning of the prohibition. Um, the uh, early bootleggers were actually Joe Reinfeld in Newark. They're talking about the principal. Yeah. You had a division. You had the Jews had their people. The Italians had their people. The uh, prohibition that starts in 1920, um, the leader of Newark was Joe Reinfeld, and the leader in New York was uh, Arnold Rothstein. Oh, wow. Arnold Rothstein was quite famous. Yes. Uh, probably had the greatest amount of influence in terms of the modern mob both the Jews and the Italians. Uh, he was a man of uh, cerebral powers. He was in, highly intelligent, came from a very, uh, came from a very well-educated family. He himself was upper middle class, but he was the black sheep of the family. And Arnold Rothstein was the uh, one who actually educated the younger generation of the young Turks of both the Italians and the Jews that the brain was far superior to the muscle and that um, cooperation was far superior than competition. Um, <clears throat> Joe Reinfeld uh, started in Newark, New Jersey as a bootlegger and he employed the young Jews to provide safety and security for his uh, shipments. Eventually, these young fellas that he employed superseded and they became, um, they dominated. They they, they, they co-opted the, the leadership. In the case of New York, uh, Arnold Rothstein had both the Italians and the Jews. He had Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, Joe Adonis. He had Meyer Lansky, Benny Siegel as uh, protectors of his whiskey, his alcohol. He was shot and killed over a card game. And as a result, the the Young Turks emerged. There was a, uh, in the case of New York, New York Italians, the Sicilians, all answered to the two mob doses of Joe Maranzano, uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, Salvatore Maranzano, yes, and Joe the boss, Masseria. Yeah. And those two mob bosses uh, were the bosses of what was known as the competition or the struggle between the the two bosses of the, and the leaders of uh, the two major groups that were known as the Castelmamari Wars. Yeah. Because they both came from Castelmamari, 
uh, in Sicily, and they held sway over the over the Italian population in New York. Whereas uh, Arnold Rothstein uh, had his own <clears throat> he had his own uh, following, and he actually engaged the young Jews and Italians to supply security for his alcohol. They, um, they, they rode shotgun for his, for his, uh, his shipments because at that time, mobs were stealing from each other and um, you had to protect, you had to protect. And the, the security was protect, provided by these, by these young mobsters. Well, the young mobsters ultimately become uh, the, the bosses themselves. In the case of New Jersey, it was Long East Roman and Doc Stature. Yeah, In the case yeah. of New York, it was Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano. And um, they eventually, the two in New York, they shot and killed Joe Maranz uh, Salvatore Maranzano, Joe the Boss Massaria. It's a, it's a, it's a well known historical fact, yeah. and emerges the modern Cosa Nostra, and in Jersey, Longies Roman long long very at very young age together with he and Doc Statue. Doc was born in eighteen ninety nine. He was five years older. Longies Roman was born nineteen oh four. Said you had young you had young men that uh, achieved leadership roles at relatively very, very young ages. The yep. maturity level was much greater, of course, than you're talking about in terms of today. Yep. So if you understand that guys were already bosses at the age of 25, 26, 27, it was an amazing story. Correct. Now, now um, I want to get, I want to, before we get to the Italian Cosa Nostra and your personal experiences, one of the things that I've kind of noticed or saw in terms of history is the Jewish gangs or the Jewish mafia, if you will, um, was more of a lifestyle, meaning, I mean, more of a, a means to an end, meaning, hey, we're going to we're going to hit the streets. Um, we're going to, you know, some were in gambling, some were in, you know, loan sharking, whatever it was. Right. Uh, bootlegging. But then the offspring of these kids, you know, they became doctors, lawyers went to kind of the professional class where the Jews kind of said, hey, you know what, this is, you know, this is, I had to do this sacrifice to make this, you know, to make you a good life. Versus the Italians, it was like, hey, this is, this is our lifestyle. This is who we are. And then the offspring became made men and, and ne ne nephews became made men, cousins became made men. And it, like what it moved on versus the Jews assimilated, right? Do you agree with that? And if so, like, why is that? Well, your, your description is accurate. Um, Jews were just a one generation. Uh, the, the mentality was, uh, let's make the money, yeah. invest it legitimately and go forward. Whereas uh, as far as the Italians were concerned, it was, um, it's a cultural thing. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a way of life. Um, hold on one second, Tom. I'm going to need to get a, a plug. The recording stopped. I need, okay, so, ahead, okay so what we're talking about is that the Jews were one generation and the Italians were, were th thinking in terms of posterity. Cool. It's more cultural with the Italians. And in fact, when they created the Cosa Nostra, uh, they, it was a, a breakdown of five different families. The Jews were part of what was known as a syndicate, but that was just a one generation matter. Yeah. None of the, the parents, uh, um, none of the, 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 uh, the, the kids that I grew up with whose fathers were connected, uh, they went on to become either businessmen or they become professionals, medicine, education, uh, so forth and so forth. My particular situation, was uh, I would consider it to, to be an aberration as it was unusual. I was actually uh, started out uh, as a businessman, but then because the circumstances, seeing that there was a tremendous amount of money to be made 
through gambling, um, I switched from selling jukeboxes and pinball machines and amusements. I learned the gambling business actually in 1970 when Meyer Lansky's organization shipped me off to Lagos, Nigeria in Africa. Wow. They had made a uh, joint venture deal with a couple of gangsters from Beirut, Lebanon, a couple of Arab gangsters from Beirut, Lebanon. And I was selected to be the manager of that particular joint venture. There, I learned it was uh, the usage. Uh, it was a, a Meyer Lansky uh, organization that were running ballet slot machines in Africa. And I was chosen to be the, the manager. So from there, I understood, I learned the, 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 uh, the tremendous potential in gambling, uh, the, the, the revenue that was realized in gambling. And when I came back from Africa, after the Arabs brought back the business in 1977, I started New York City, I opened up the, the city, which had been closed down from 1941 by LaGuardia, who closed down Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello slot machines. Mm. I opened the market again in 1977 uh, with slot machines. Of course, if, uh, it was illegal, but um, it took off like a, like a, like a, uh, a rocket ship. So, okay. Now, you, you said it well, the Jewish gangsters, one generation, right? But then this is the part that I, I think you probably have a keen understanding. If you take your father's generation, right? And then you take that next generation, which I want to include the Jerry Katinas, um, Abolis, like some really serious guys in the Genovese family, right? And across the five families, right? But mm -hmm. then the next generation, right? wasn't as strong and on top of it as the italian americans assimilated became doctors became lawyers became businessmen the mob didn't evolve to match meaning hey i'm going to stay in this life right but let's get involved with medical fraud let's get bigger with stock fraud let's wear suits every day the, the mob kind of stayed now the genovese was a little different so we'll talk about that in a second but the mob in general from the 50s to even the 90s kind of stayed in the street and never really evolved. People call this, they get on me all the time, oh, you're trying to gentrify the mob. No, not, not at all. But I believe the mob never evolved because of what you're saying. It was cultural. It was, um, uh, you know, like, like it's got only Italians. And, and they didn't get the best recruits to their ranks because the guys that stayed in the life were on the street. What do you think about that? Because I feel like the mob didn't evolve. And I think before Rico, before everything else, it was one of the main reasons for the downfall was a lack of innovation to rackets and the lack of assimilation to other, you know, to other um, other types of Italians, which were professional class, et cetera. Do you agree with that, Myron? You know, uh, I almost it's a very it's a very intelligent appraisal the, the, the to a certain extent the, for the Italian. For the for the mob for Cosa Nostra, yeah. it's 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 essentially it's essentially um, it, it's almost like a religion. Yeah. All right. Whereas, you know, one, one second, I, I can't. Hello, young lady. Okay. So continue, Mario. So, so it's, I think your appraisal is very good, very intelligent. I think that if there's, if there's a certain almost a, a, a religious passion about being a member. Uh, it's, in, it's inculcated into the, into the mindset of these kids that came from neighborhoods. And, uh, they see it in the form of machismo, um, uh, so it's almost, maybe it's even more, it's more, more than a religion, it's almost in some cases a, a cult. Yeah. Look, look at your, your your swearing your swearing allegiance to a an institution to a family, and it's telling you that your this family is takes precedence over your actual family. Correct. So, if you 
if you're inducted into that society, into that kind of mentality, you're told that this has been an institution of the south of Italy, of the Sicilian, the Neapolitan, the Calabresa, the Barresa. Yeah. This has been going on for centuries. And you are the, the, um, the, the um, continuation. It, it, it's, it's like, um, it's the indoctrination very similar to, uh, <laughs> if I can make a comparison to being an Orthodox Jew, except that your loyalty in this particular case first is to your family your actual family whereas in the case of of a of somebody that swears loyalty to the new family and takes the oath of a murder and uh, promises never to uh, violate the rules of Cosa Nostra and so forth it's um the, so the, so it's not it's actually not part of the the generation, the next generation of the Jewish mob, or for example, even in the in the case of the Russian Jewish mob, yeah. the, the, it's it's another it's another uh, example of the Russians of the children of the Russian mob, notwithstanding the fact that they're Jewish, that they use the question of illegality as a stepping stone or a, as a negotiable as an as a negotiable vehicle in order to get to a certain point and then turn it over for le legitimate uh, investment got it now um got it i'm not i'm by the way i'm not being critical i'm being yeah. analytical of course that's fine so um no i get that and and, and history kind of like what has to be admired about about the Italian mentality, about that uh, Sicilian Neapolitan and so forth mentality, is the fact that these kids remain tough. Yeah. Uh, whereas, whereas um, <laughs> there there's a certain um, so, there's a certain something to admire in the fact that these kids. Um, develop a, are, are raised within that kind of a tough mentality. Now, does it, is it, is it uh, compatible with the, with the 20th century, the 21st century? That's another, the, the, with the 21st century, that's, that's something else. You raised the question, are they uh, evolving? Well, um, I think that is the, 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 the next question I really think needs to be discussed in this highly intelligent discussion is, is there a need for a mob as far as the future is concerned? That, that's a great question. Really quick, uh, uh, Marin, because this is what, this is where, okay, and we'll get into how it kind of grew in Italy, why it flew, why like decline here. And, one was, like I said earlier, I felt it was a lack of adaptation, right? Then the second is the lack of utility, right? So why the Indragada and other ones went global, the Cosa Nostra became a neighborhood thing, right? And you went to Myron if you were connected or you went to so-and-so if you had a beef or issue that you couldn't go to the police for, for whatever reason, or as you know, we discussed in other interviews, the mob was pretty expedient in their justice versus the legal system. So it provided a utility, right? But kind of after the 90s, mid 90s on, it no longer serviced the community, therefore lost what made it powerful. So you beg the question, do we need a mob now? I'm asking you. And number two, if so, what does it look like? Um. I don't know, I, I, I really don't know 
if we if there is a need for the for 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 the mob i think you've summarized it very well yeah. it was a neighborhood kind of a situation um it was expedient justice um listen it's it's everybody has the capacity to to work outside the law because um look at let's take if we really want to say uh, this if we want to define uh, an organized criminal enterprise i think yeah. probably today i would say that uh, and i said it on the on the uh, patrick but david interview yeah. that the government <laughs> is is the yeah. greatest is the greatest organized criminal enterprise in the world they can do anything do whatever they want yep. um they have the power they got the money they're the power the time the facilities the the faculties the 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 they have the the organization and so forth yep. so um yeah there'll always be guys that are going to look to uh circumvent to come up with the um uh to get around certain things or, or or create or create what the what the market create uh, uh um respond to the demand of the market uh when we created the the gambling machine business it was at the time just about a year or two before the legalization of casinos in atlantic city and people wanted to gamble and we provided them with a service of yep. putting slot machines in bodegas and in candy stores and in clubs and the bars and so forth and so forth. And it was a tremendous business. People wanted to gamble. And we provide them with that the same way that that the uh, prior to the question of the lotteries, the state lotteries, the the mob was providing uh, the numbers business, uh, sports yep. betting, right? Eventually, government is really the organized criminal enterprise because when they see something is profitable, when they see something is profitable, they go ahead and they take it away from the from the mobsters and yep. they take it for themselves. And yep. what they'll do is they'll say that what the mobster is doing is illegal, it's immoral, but what we're going to do, which is exactly the same thing, is very good because the taxes from this particular activity, commercial activity is going to be used for the benefit of the masses and so forth and so on, which we know is uh, highly suspect, uh, suspicious, uh, especially when you look at Atlantic City going back uh, almost 45 years, you see that Atlantic City is still the same uh, shithole that it was going back 45 years ago when gambling was legalized and supposedly it was going to turn Atlantic City into a fantastic place. It's, just, it's, it's, it's the same uh, rat hole that it, today uh, as it was at the time that they were building the casinos. Um, we'll get to- But that's a reality. Yeah. And you have to accept the reality. The big fish eat the little fish and that's the way, the way, the way of the world. Agreed. And we'll get to the slot machines, ballets, and Jerry Keene in a minute. What was, um, tell me about the first time you ever met Meyer Lansky. So I only met him the one time. And that was in Israel in September of 1970. He knew my father very well because he used to come to Newark, New Jersey. Yeah. And uh, he was friendly at that time, uh, very close, not friendly. Uh, the, 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 the bosses, the two bosses of the Jewish mob, were well, actually there were three bosses, four bosses. Um, of course, it was Meyer and Bugsy, Benny Siegel, and the others were Abner Longis Wilman and Doc Statchett. I mean, most people never heard of Abner Longis Wilman and never heard of Joe Doc Statchett, but those two were really on the same level of leadership and. Meyer Lansky and his brother Jake came off into Newark, New Jersey to meet with Abner Logis Wilman for, uh, because 
they work together in terms of uh, making decisions for, for the Jews. Uh, again, we did not have a, a fixed structure as, uh, oh, they, they were the appointed bosses and, uh, and so forth and say, so, yeah, an underboss, you had a capo regiment. No, it was just by virtue of their leadership, their intelligence, yeah. their, their, uh, their entrepreneurship that they emerged as the bosses. So the gender of, of all the five families now, let's say the sixth of Cavaconti, and we'll be really transparent, of all of them, the one that has been strong and still has any relative strength was the Genovese, right? And that's because they probably had five leaders since they, they you know, uh, they started out in 1931, right? Um, and one of those leaders specifically um, that you and I spoke on the phone briefly and you kind of blew my mind. Tell us about Jerry Cantina. I, I call, I, I'm going to say this now. He's the most important mobster you never really heard of. So tell us a bit about Jerry Cantina. So I know him very well because he was my father's partner. Wow. I mentioned the name of Joe Doc Snatcher. Joe Doc Snatcher. Is, okay, so let, let's go back in time. When Longies Wilman was emerging as the boss of Jersey and uh, the most respected together with Meyer Lansky, leader of the Jewish gangs, uh, gangsters in the United States of America, there was a young man by the name of Jerry Katina who was the bridge between the Jews and the Italians. He was very close to Longy. Uh, some say he was on an equal level. Jerry Katina uh, became, so in 1915, the end of the, the, end of the Jewish mob um, is, is, takes place with the, in 9th, February 1959, with the death of Abner Logis Wilman. Yeah. Um, he, he died by hanging. The question was always, and it'll be legend forever, did Mr. Wilman die by suicide or did, uh, was, he, was he killed by, by the mob? Um, my father at the time said to me that it was suicide. However, Understand that my father was partners with Jerry Katina. Mm. Jerry Katina bought the interest of Joe Doc Stature in 1940, 45 or 46, immediately after the war. Mr. Stature had gone to Los Angeles and built the um, Moulin Rouge nightclub. And then ultimately he worked, he was a partner with the, in, in the casino and in in not the Flamingo, but in the sands, together with Meyer Lansky. He was very close with Meyer Lansky. In fact, when Doc Stature uh, made a deal with Robert Kennedy, uh, he accepted exile to, the, to Israel. In 1970, in July of 1970, Mr. Lansky knew that he was gonna be indicted for tax evasion. He left the United States and he went to Israel. Uh, Doc Stature was already there from 1963, uh, and that's the, the 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 one time I met Mr. Lansky. We spent an entire Jewish Sabbath together uh, at the old Hotel Sheraton in Tel Aviv, yeah. and it was very interesting because. Uh, he came to the hotel for the express purpose of meeting me. That was a month before I was uh, scheduled to go to Africa to run the slot machine business for his organization. He had uh, specifically told Doc Stature that he wanted to meet Myron. And the after, it was a social afternoon. And at the end of the afternoon, all the guests had left. And I was... Um, left behind with uh, Mr. Stature and Mr. Lansky. They, uh, I was 30, 31, 32 years of age at the time. 
uh, and they took me to the corner of the uh, hotel lobby and uh, so that we'd be out of the earshot of everybody. And they specifically asked me what the political situation of Mr. Mr. Katina was at that time. He had refused to testify along with 18 other uh, mob guys, refusal to testify after being granted immunity in a grand jury investigation. Wow. And um, the reason I find out was able to put the pieces together years later that their concern was not about Mr. Katina's health, about his freedom to exercise rule over the monies of the Rakoff that came out of Las Vegas and the separation of those monies and their destination as to whether the monies were going to be sent to Mr. Stature and to Mr. Lansky. In reality, Mr. Katina, when he emerged as the boss of the Genovese crime family after Vito Genovese went, went to prison and after Tommy Ryan was murdered, Mr. Katina became the sole acting boss and some say he was the actual boss of the Genovese crime family. Kimmer Lombardo, right? I, you know, I really don't know the political yeah. the 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 details of the what i understand it was pete laplaca and i was i i don't know i really don't know my i'm going to put it to you in in a peculiar way but my hero was mr katina Got it. i thought in my opinion that man could have been the president of the united states of america my father said he could have been the head of the general electric he can run the Pentagon. In my estimation, at 84 years of age, when I see people of leadership, Mr. Katina, from my point of view, was remarkable. He could have been the president of the United States of America. Wow. He was disciplined. He was class. He was self-educated. Yes. And he was very careful in his associations. He was, he was somebody that evolved as we started the conversation at the very beginning, as somebody that evolved into a, into a tremendous, tremendous leader and businessman. In fact, it was Mr. Katina who's responsible for having uh, made the Bally Manufacturing Company, took it out of foreclosure, and with, through a few connections with extremely successful Jewish guys, around the United States of America. In reality, when Mr. Lansky left the United States and went to Israel, Mr. Katina became not only the acting boss, or the boss of the Genovese crime family, he became the boss of the Jews. Whoever was remaining as the Jews in that world. Interesting. Mr. Katina, Mr. Katina, everybody answered to Mr. Katina. Now he was fair. Yeah, he was a fair. He was a man of justice, and there was no um. He, he just it, there was no compromise on truth. Yeah. Now, one of your interviews. I was checking some of your interviews out this week. He would be caught reading a lot. What are some of the things he would read and give us a little bit about his routine? I always like to unpack what makes these guys so successful. What are some of the things he would, he would read and give, give us a little bit about some of his habits? So if you walked into his office, he had a desk at the corner. He was, my father's other partner was Abe Green, who was a remarkable human being also. Okay. He was Mr. Katina's closest associate. Jerry, uh, Abe Green had a a quality of genius to him. And the quality of genius was he never talked. Hmm. But he had an aura about him that everybody wanted to be around him because the man that doesn't talk is a, has a certain mystique to him. Yes. Uh, Mr. Katina, uh, Abe, Jerry Katina, Abe Green, could communicate without talking. He was his closest confidant. Uh, the two of them shared a big office, Mr. Katina 
would have on his desk the Christian Science Monitor, the Manchester Guardian, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. Um, He would skim the papers in the morning, spend the whole day. um, There were very, very few people that would come to see him at the office. Again, he was very discreet about the people that were allowed to see him. As a matter of fact, the only time I actually ever saw him lose his patience was a couple of guys showed up and he was uh, the secretary said, Mr. Katina, these gentlemen here to see you. He came out to see him and he took one look at them and said, how many times? And it was in a voice that I never heard Mr. Katina use. How many times have I told you guys you never to come here? Well, as big and as tough as these guys were, they lowered their heads and put the tail between their legs and they just went red in the face and just left there, realizing that they violated cardinal rule of Mr. Katina never to show up at his place of business, at his legitimate place of business. And Mr. Katina, again, always dressed carefully, dressed discreetly, very, very, in fact, he was just, again, he was extraordinary. Um, as I think back at 84 years of age, yeah. I knew him since I was a little kid running around in short pants. Yeah. After all, he came into our lives when I was seven years old. Um, and when I think back over the, over the years, uh, now with the advantage of having lived quite a life myself, Yes. understanding the nuances and the uh, rules, regulations, traditions, con- customs of that world. Um, I say to myself, it was an extraordinary human being. Wow. So had, had the opportunity been presented to him, this man was uh, made for, for truly uh, I could have been the president of the United States of America. Oh, certainly, certainly, if you compare him to the present president of the United States, I don't even. It's not even. It's not even a fair comparison. But if let's say you you would, you would compare him to a Donald Trump, to a or to a sophisticated version of a Donald Trump, you you would have gotten. Uh, you would have you. And by the way, the reason Donald Trump, incidentally, is that good is because he was mob influenced. He yeah. did business with the mob. And uh, I think that the mob, their style rubbed off on him. I think that he had a good working relationship with them. Yeah. And he ran the presidency of the United States of America like a mob boss. A lot of people say that. Now, now, Myron, now, to this day, because I do want to talk a bit about Jerry and, and Bally's and kind of how, how that kind of um, evolved. Well, it, it's quick, an, exa- uh, an example. Oh, go ahead, go it's ahead. an example. Yeah. Tom, Tommy, it's an example of Mr. Katina's class. Yeah. Uh, the, the original Bally Manufacturing Company, uh, its success product was a game called the Bally Bingo Machine. Where are you from originally, Tom? Uh, Scotch Plains, New Jersey, and my family's from Italy. So. If you went to any of the neighborhoods in Newark, New Jersey, if you yeah. went to Lodi, yeah. uh, any, uh, all over northern New Jersey, and also in Trenton, yeah. there was, and through, as down the shore, the, the guys in the gaming business ran what was known as the Bally Bingo Machine. The Bally Bingo Machine was a subterfuge pinball machine but it was actually a gambling device. Robert Kennedy banned that machine in 1963. Um, He had a law that was passed called the Eastland Act that amended the Johnson Act that made the Bally Bingo machine effectively the same as as a slot machine. That put Bally Manufacturing out of business. They went into foreclosure. The owner of the factory, Ray Maloney, died. <clears throat> the manager of the company was a fellow by the name of Bill O'Donnell. Yeah. 
yes. who actually was very, very effective, knew the business. And they um, were ready. They had plans to revolutionize the slot machine business. They came up with a hopper system that would change the machine, a slot machine from a mechanical device to electrical mechanical, which was spit out hundreds and eventually thousands of coins. And then eventually you would have the dollar bill acceptor and so forth. Bill O'Donnell called my father, who was the uh, connection to the, to, uh, the distributorship for the, for the Bally product in New York, New State, in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. And asked my father if he would make an a appointment, introduce him to Jerry Cantina. Jerry Cantina, Mr. Never knew anybody from the factories. He was always in the background. And my father arranged for a meeting that day. I was there. I remember it like it was like it was the this afternoon. Right. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Bill O'Donnell was very, very, very qualified, came, very, very confident, came out and laid it out for Jerry Cantina that the factory could be taken out of, um, it could be taken out of uh, foreclosure. They could build slot, they could build pinball machines and so forth. But the real idea was we have a hopper system that will revolutionize the slot machine business. We've tested it, it works. And what we need is we need money to take the, the factory and Bill O'Donnell explained and showed, in fact, the figures that there would be, they could always liquidate the um, tools and dyes and, and make a profit and still make a profit, yeah. even yeah. if the slot machine business was to fail. The um, Bill o, uh, Jerry Katina was a visionary, saw the, the strength of it. He made a call to um, a family that owned Emprise. I don't think, I can't think of the name right now, but it's here. Emprise owned stadiums, the concessions at stadiums. They were in Buffalo, New York. Yeah. It was a Jewish family. And he called Sam Klein from Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Also a, 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 a very successful cigarette machine operator, uh, entrepreneur and so forth. They raised the money with uh, in a matter of, of uh, two hours, raised the money, bought the company out of foreclosure and uh, built the slot machine. And Mr. Katina sent my father's partner, Abe Green to Las Vegas to go see Dean Martin. And Dean Martin introduced Abe Green to all the hotels in Vegas. And they tested the Valley slot machine in all the hotels uh, and it, it eradicated everything. It became so successful that 95% of the slot machines of Nevada were Bali slot machines. And then Atlantic City, they not only had the slot machines, but then they started the hotel venture as well. But that, 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 that's a different year that the, all the old timers that were mob connected how to sell out their interest in 1980 when Bally, or 81, when a Bally, when Bally decided to build uh, the hotel and in Atlantic place. City, yeah. all the, everybody that was connected with Mr. Katina, how to sell out the interest. But here's my question though, mine, didn't they really, weren't they just all the straw men, straw men and women, or did they really exit legally? Oh no, they exited. It was, uh, it, it, they, they went out and they were multimillionaires at that point. So right. again, the mentality, why stay in there? Yeah, if you made your money, and, you're right. And, and, and why be greedy? They had all the money that they ever wanted. They lived, they lived great lives in, in retirement. True. There, there was, Jerry Katina actually went to the, to the commission and gave up a tremendous amount of his asset and asked for permission to retire. He was the only one that was granted permission. <laughs> so wow. you can see that this man, this man had a different mental process 
than than those that stayed in there. He he he, he suffered enough. As he did, I think, in six years or six and a half years. Yeah. For refusal to testify to the grand jury, That's he had enough of jail. Think, right. That was it, I think. Yeah. So when he came out, he went to the commission, gave up a tremendous amount, and he retired. He's still retired with wealth and with health. He lived until I think 96, 97 years of age. Yep. I I was in jail at the time, but uh, my wife went to a wedding, and she she was invited to a wedding of uh, Abe Green's son, and she says she marveled. The man was 94 years of age. He was up dancing with his wife for every dance. God bless. What were your rackets? What were you personally involved in? Gambling. I started the, the slot machine business. I was, I knew the business. I knew the, the everything, the coin operated business, jukeboxes, pinball machines, arcade machines. Uh, and then I went into the gambling machine business and I was involved with the video, video poker machines. Got it. Now to kind of go back a little bit to the Jerry Katina and I want to, again, part of the West side, part of the Genovese family. Along the way, right, to this day, because I've interviewed other made men that, you know, have since, you know, converted, rolled over, if you will. Um, and they said whenever you dealt with the West Side and even spoke to one former captain for the West Side, they operated in a shrouded level of secrecy and they had strong leadership along the way. You can't get lucky, you know, whether it be Chin, Lombardo, Katina, Genovese, Luciano, and so forth, right? It's the culture of that family that they had good leadership, but also the way they operated. You get what I'm saying? So like how, when you dealt with guys from the Genovese family, were they different when you dealt with the other families? And if so, how? Well, I can only tell from my own experience. Please. Um, The, 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 the quality, the, it's, it's all in the leadership, Tommy. Yeah. If you have great leaders, great. you're going to have good followers. Yeah. And those good followers are eventually going to become great leaders because they were trained properly. Correct. Uh, I was, my guy was Louis Gatto. It was Louis Red. Want to get you ever hear of him, Tommy? Yes, absolutely. Is was that Streaky? It's Louis Streaky, right? Yeah. I want to hear, uh, <laughs> do tell he about the Patterson, the Gattos. Well, I only, yeah. I, I, I met with the old man yeah. once a week, sometimes twice a week for, for almost 20 years. Uh, I had great reverence for him. He was extremely intellectual, yeah. extremely intelligent and very disciplined. And as long as you understood that, yeah. and as long as you stayed within the, uh, those margins, yeah. Of uh, what he expected. I had a very professional relationship with him. To this very day, I will quote many of his thoughts and many of his, uh, his um, he was just an intellect. Yeah. Again, here's a man, opportunity given. The man could have been the head of any, he was re remarkable, a remarkable mind. Uh, he was a military man. He had served in the military, U.S. Marines. Wow. He was, he was a very special guy. Very, very special. I don't want to call him a guy. Very they, were, they were very, those guys were, the Genovese were very, very, and, and again, like guys that follow this stuff, it's not as well known, and that's probably by design. The Streaky Gatto and, and, and the, um, the Genovese in Patterson were strong up until like 10 years ago. Like they did it the right way. Again, the West Side Genovese family, a group of guys, it doesn't seem like an accident. So again, I, I always try to unpack and what made that, what made, like for example, right? I had a, I don't say who, I had a family member over yesterday and we, we were talking, we were catching up. And, and the Cavacantes never really, got out of Elizabeth, respectfully. I don't want to say too much, but they never really got out of Elizabeth, right? You remember in Newark, the five families were there 
the Cavacantes weren't really around. Patterson, they weren't really there. But the Genovese, which was a New York family, in my opinion, ruled New Jersey. And the Gambinos gave them a run, too, and Lucchese's a bit. But You know, uh, did you know Andy Gerard? Did you ever yes. hear of him? Yes, I heard of him. So before. Andy Gerard, of course, received leadership. He received the baton of leadership from, from the boot. Correct. Right? He was a great leader. I, I, I never had any dealings with him. Yeah. But in the conversations, I uh, used to run into him at the uh, um, Calabria restaurant in Livingston over the yeah. years, over the many years. But the man great, was great the man was the man was discreet. Yeah. He was classy. Yeah. He was highly intelligent, and he was a man of principle. So again, the guys that were around, uh, I mean, the boot selected uh, Andy Gerard to be the. the um, to be his, um, what do you call it? Um, it's like an emissary. To, to, he, he named him to be in charge. Yeah, a successor. Uh, a successor. And uh, Andy was, Andy Gerard had a good crew around him. Yeah. Of course, that, that was a branch of the Genovese, Again. of the Genovese people. Again, it all boils down to the question of leadership. The old expression that the uh, fish thinks at the head or it's, uh, you know, if it's, a, you got a quality leader, you're going to have, you're going to have, you're going to, you're going to, listen, if you're going to do business, yeah, you're going to be successful if your leader is, knows what he's doing. You're going, he's going to pick good people. He's going to get rid of the bad people. You don't want one yeah. bad apple in the, in the basket. You get rid of those people. Again, it boils down to leadership. And I think that's the answer to your question. Yep. So, did you deal with Richie the Boot much? No, I. My, that was my father's. That was my father's. Anyway, he has no yeah. My father, my father bought his alcohol from uh, um, Battaglia, from Carmen Battaglia, and who was again? My father was with Longy. Although, my father had a very good relationship with the Boot, notwithstanding the fact that Longy's Wellman and the Boot were arch enemies. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, the, 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 the uh, Longy's, uh, Longy had uh, put a hit on the, on the boot. The boot survived. The story was that either Al Capone or his brother or his cousin came to, at the request of Doc Stature, came to Newark and made peace between the two of them. They had a major celebration for three days. I think it was at the Victoria Castle. Or one of the places that was owned by the uh, by the boot. Sure. Now it's a, it's a, it's in it's on Google. Yeah. It was a very very famous story. So so you, you saw some of the. Let's be honest. Some of the most preeminent people in the life, right? Would be Jewish. One second, Tommy. Put me on hold yeah. for a second. Yeah. Put me on hold for one second. Go ahead. No worries. No worries. Just a quick pause. But you dealt with a lot of the preeminent people. What did you think of the more modern day era? What did you think of John Gotti? What did you think of the Chin, Casso, the, you know, these guys? What are some of the guys a more re recent era can you speak to and give us your opinion versus some of these guys that preceded them? Um, the, you see, Tommy, uh, I'm, I'm a spoiled brat. <laughs> I was around Jerry Katina. Yeah, I was I was raised by Jerry Katina, Longies Wilman. Yeah, by my father, by Abe Green. Yeah, I mean these are guys that uh, Tommy I, uh, I when I was a kid, growing up, we learned to watch our language in front of these people. Wow, we were not sloppy. Yeah, uh, you didn't want to make. You don't want to say anything out of line uh, that you, you you just didn't want to say or do anything out of line that you would be taken where you would be taken to you know task for. I it, it just that was the kind of a world that I was that I that I grew up in. 
they, of course, they, they, they were wonderful guys. They were lots of fun. Yeah. They had great senses of humor. They, you know, the, and so forth and so forth. There was a, and there was an extreme pride of ethnic pride of being Jewish. Yeah. And there was a, as I learned also at the same time, I have a, a, an ethnic pride of being Italian. I'm an Orthodox Jew. God bless. I am super, super knowledgeable. My son is one of the great Talmudic rabbis of our time. Oh, beautiful. He's, uh, <laughs> he's a rabbi with a wife and eight kids, all, of course, super religious. Yes. Uh, but I really had a, a very ecumenical, I went to Seton Hall for a semester. I was very close to all the priests and so forth to this yeah. day. I'm very friendly with uh, Bishop uh, Saratelli. I just um, we were raised with great respect, yeah. and um, you honored your elders. There was no ands, ifs, or buts. So when you talk to me in terms of uh, any of the other fellows, uh, I mean, if I met John Gotti, I. Uh, I would, of course, respect him. Yeah, uh, he was a leader. Yeah. He was a he was he was a leader. He took a decision and so forth. Am I in a position to make these kind of judgments? Not at all. Good point. Not at all. I can only tell you, Jerry Katina. I can tell you, Meyer Lansky was a very fine gentleman, very proud Jew, a very proud American, a great patriot, and so forth and so forth. Um, and I can give tremendous star uh, examples to support and to back those things i can talk about the people that i knew yeah. the people that i know and i can i can tell you that are there people that uh, um suffered consequences there were many that suffered consequences for for violation of the rules the regulations yeah and uh, that i know guys that were greedy yes i always said that greed killed more people than bullets True. What about uh, did you deal with Bobby Mann at all? He was a very fine gentleman. Yeah. I had the pleasure of being in his company for uh, a whole afternoon. Many, just he and myself, and uh, the old man Joe Pepe uh, is about uh, Pepe's about a little little Pepe, uh, who was up from uh, he was Portly. He was with Joe Adonis. He was an old timer, but Bobby Mann was a very classy gentleman. Very, very, again, you're talking about leadership. Yeah. You're talking about a very fine man. Uh, you know what You know what his question was that day? He says, you know what, Myron? We have a certain business we'll take care of. It'll, it only, that won't take very long. Tell me about the history. How does, uh, where's the, the, where does the Ashkenazic Jews separate from the Sephardic Jews? I said, well, do you want the, the way. Do you, I said, do you want the short answer or do you want the long answer? I said, no, no, I want, I want the long answer. Well, hold on, hold on. Was it one was essentially Russian and one was essentially Persian? Is that the good answer? Am I wrong? Uh, you want to make another couple of hour uh, interview with me so I can. I got a feeling we're going to do another one. So if you want to give us a short. Yeah, answer, I'm, a, like... I'm, a, I'm, a Jew, I'm a Jewish historian. I know yeah. I know history uh, backwards, forwards, inside and outside. But the, no, the it's a, it's a more it's basically the Ashkenazic culture evolved from the time of the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans. And we became part of the Roman Empire. All right of the empire that moved north to the Rhineland between France and between the, uh, 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 between uh, France and Germany, yeah. whereas the, uh, the Sephardic Jew is the descendant of the Spanish, uh, yes. of the Spanish occupation from the years 711 to 1492. And the Eastern Jew, which is the Mizrahi Jew, he's a, descendant of the destruction of the first temple, which took place in the year 586 before the common era, before Jesus Christ era. And uh, they're the ones that occupied uh, Iraq, Syria, Persia, 
and the and the stands like so Afghanistan. I got it. I got it like semi right. Yeah, not bad. It's in the for the short answer. That's not, pretty good. Not bad for a goyim from the Jersey, you know. <laughs> well, I actually I have a peculiar. Uh, I never I never refer to the Italians as the goyim. Got which it. the Hebrew ex- translation of the word goyim means the people of the other nations. Yes. The Italians, for your information, Please. according to our greatest sage of Bible, of interpretation, was a rabbi from uh, France by the name of Rashi, lived a thousand years ago. He said that the Italians of the South are Italki Shalyevan. That means the Italians of Greece. And they are our cousins through the ancestry of the two brothers, Jacob and Esau, all right? And by the way, if there's DNA done on many Italians of the south of Italy, you'll find out that there is Jewish uh, uh, DNA. Wow, we we might do a separate, I'm like fascinated with Jewish history, because I don't talk about it much because people look because at because the south of Italy, the south of Italy was conquered by the Spaniards, correct? By the Spanish king in 1492. Urban, that right? was the it was the Inquisition right. of Spain that was applied to the south of Italy. So you had fifty thousand Jews living in Sicily at that time. Correct. It was a large population, and on top of it, Napoli was was. I think it was the Bourbons who took over that area, and that made the birth of the Camorra, which was used as kind of the policing society because they were the tough guys, and that's how the Camorra rose. And it all kind of starts to start to start. I love that. Mario, we, we we will schedule another episode for just for just on his with, pl- with pleasure, with pleasure. So so, but I, I finish that historical thought, and then we'll cl- we'll wrap it up with some closing statements. Which thought was that? that no, I'm just saying if you wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how there's a lot of Jews in Sicily. Um, obviously, there's a lot of Jews in southern Italy at some point. So, uh, so there is an a, there is an affinity, a strong affinity between the Italian and the Jew. Hundred percent. And that facilitated, by the way, that facilitated a, the ability for the Jew and for the and for the Italian to be able to sit down and to find cooperation. Of course. The original Italian uh, Sicilian, Castelmamari, they were xenophobic. Uh, Joe the Boss, Masseria, and Masseria Salvatore Maranzano Banana, really didn't, they so didn't Masseria. trust, yeah. they didn't trust anybody, let's say, from Calabria, from Barre, from Napoli, and so forth, whereas the, the, new, the new mentality of Charlie Lucky Luciano and so forth saw that there was an affinity between Jews and Italians, right? Yeah. And so, um, which is which is a given. You, everybody will tell you. I'm, it's not only Myron Sugarman, although I can give you some historical connection. This, by the way, all right, for your information, please. When we were taken as slaves. Uh, uh, after the destruction of the second temple, the Romans took us to Rome as slaves. There were no women. So who did the Jewish men marry? Roman women. And converted them. Most Jewish women of the Ashkenazic uh, of the Ashkenazic uh, world has DNA which is non-Jewish. Really? You can take that to the bank. Oh, shit. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Wow. So, yes, there were no, if you, we, we, for example, the Ethiopian Jews, all right, coming from the land of Ethiopia. Correct. Why are they dark skinned and look like normal, average Ethiopian people? Because they mixed race. Because the, the, the soldiers of King Solomon went to Ethiopia and married with native women. With the Egyptians too, or no? So in all probability, the, 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 the Jews 
where we did live in, we lived in Egypt. Oh, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> if, if, um, I'm not gonna I would, 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 in fact, yes, we were by law, by Jewish law, we were never to return to Egypt. All right. However, the Jews did, went back to Egypt when it belonged, again, Egypt was dominated by various, by various, uh, by the Greeks, by the, by uh, Alexander the Great, by the Romans and so forth. Yes, Jews went wherever there was opportunity. And at one time in history, we had a fantastic uh, civilization in two places, Alexandria and the ancient city of Cairo, which was called Fustat. Correct, correct. So I, have, I just have two more questions before we wrap up. Um, the first question um, is, you get a phone call, okay, tomorrow. And you, um, you get invited, this is all hypothetically, of course, of course you're straight an hour now, but the head of the Genovese family, whoever that is, calls you in and you're kind of like an acting consigliere and elder statesman, right? They know you saw the good, bad, and the ugly. And they say, listen, you know what? We're doing okay, we survived, but we wanna last another 400 years, right? Myron, what do we do? What kind of advice you give to the head of the Genovese family right now knowing everything you know, knowing the current environment. You can't just say, hey, hang it up. It's not that simple. As you mentioned, it's cultural. What does a Genovese family have to do to last another 400 years? Um, everything is uh, based upon advanced technology. Yeah. You, 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 we, we can't stand flat-footed, all right? We have to evolve with the technology. And then with the technology, you need to also at the same time evolve mentally, psychologically, socially, yeah. culturally. We cannot um, we, we just we it's it's not if you wanna if you want to achieve success, you're going to have to use um, you make your make everybody make it pick only educated people. Got it. Educated and, um, oh God, the question of the of the uh, allegiance to the to the oath and so forth. Um, you know, the 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 question of swearing to Omerta, right? The, the, the 19, the, we have 18, there's a prayer called the Shemona Esra in Hebrew, means 18. Okay. It's, the, it's the essence of prayer in the Jewish religion. In the time of the Romans, the, the rabbis said, 18 is not enough, we need a 19th. So they said, what is the prayer of the 19th? The prayer of the 19th is called Lamalchinim. Lamalchinim in Hebrew means the informers. We pray every day, three times a day, to God to exterminate, to extricate, liquidate all the informers on the face of this earth. That's a religious rule. Interesting. So when somebody tells me they swear to Omerta, never to violate, never to be an informer and to kill all informers. That's not a foreign thought to me mm. because the Orthodox Jew is praying three times a day to God to eradicate, extricate, and liquidate the informers. Brilliant. Brilliant. Wow. I never thought of that. I like how you... Well, how you I, don't think, I don't think there's too many people have thought about that, but in reality... Yeah. Any society, if it's going to have cohesion Correct. and if it's going to have importance and rig and significance, it needs to have people that are going to swear to Omerta. There needs, there needs to be something that binds it. All right. Final question, Myron. Tomorrow you could have lunch with any gangster, dead or alive. Who is it and why? Who would I want to be with? You have lunch tomorrow. 
12 o'clock with any gangster, dead or alive. Who is it and why? Mr. Mr. Katina. Mr. Katina, number one, uh, Abe Green. I love that man. Very, very special man. Yeah. Mr. Swellman, I'd like to invite Mr. Swellman. Yeah. I'd like to invite Meyer Lansky. Nice. Uh, I think that would be uh, my choice. Uh, there's others as well. And Louis Red and Louis, Go Louis Streaky. Wow. I have very, very special reverence for that man. Um, and in all probability, it would be a, a very thought-provoking... Uh, I, I would love to ask them their views with regards to the world situation today, <laughs> Particu particularly, particularly with regards to um, um, the balance of powers that are taking place in the world today. Um, I have a very, very negative view of world leadership today because I disagree totally. And I think that if at that table of the names that we just mentioned, we were to, I would think that they would think it exactly the way I see it. As far as the failure of world leadership uh, pertaining as we, as, as, as we're judging um, the current conflict between Putin of Russia and Ukraine. Interesting. There was no need. There was absolutely no purpose, nothing that justifies this war. Well, don't talk about it too much because they what they do is if we mention the U word and the R word, it it um it gets like a tag and like nobody sees it. It's crazy. We'll talk separately about. Okay. That. Okay. Like, so I don't mean I don't getting mean, back. I want to get to that. Out to as many people as we can. And if we bring that up, the AI yeah. picks it up and it gets. Okay. Down. So the answer to your question is yeah. those people were highly intelligent, yeah. had a real deep sense of understanding of the meaning of leadership. Got it. And power and the usage of power. Power oftentimes is the power that you do not use. Correct. I agree with that. It's the power that you have. And it's the power that you do not use. Agreed. I, I agree with that. Um, yep. And, and that uh, it's a good way to end it. Myron, I got a feeling we're going to do a part two. Um, actually, God willing, we'll do a part two because I, uh, I still think there's a lot that we could unpack. Um, I respect you as an individual. You've been through a lot. You shared a lot of information. Um, I kind of called you... Uh, Last week, I saw on the fly you came on, which I appreciate. You're in Jersey. I'm working on getting a studio, so maybe if, if we're, you know, all in good health, we can do a studio version as well. But um, I just want to thank you, and I'll give you uh, the final send off, my friend. Final send off is that your questions, your discussion, perfect ten. Wow, perfect ten. And you've been you 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 manage you manage to go deeper. And to be able to draw out from me thoughts that um, were very profound. It was a great, great, great interview. Not, not me being just a great interview. It takes two to tango. It was very good, Tom. I'm a, I'll be lying. I'm a little taken back because I, I hold you in high regard. And um, wow. How, by the way, how did you, how did you hear of me? Uh, PBD. Patrick, Patrick, but yeah, David. Yeah. I think, by the way, I think Michael Francesi does a great job. Yeah, I had, uh, him, on, I had him on in 17. Um, he's coming back on. We have a date nailed down. Um, I know Mike, we, he always answers me. He's always professional with me. And uh, I look forward to having him back on. Michael, Michael Francis is very articulate. Yes. I, I watched uh, quite a number of his, uh, his, he did, as a matter of fact, he did something 
uh, I think about 10 days ago, a week ago or so, uh, on the question of the history of the Jewish mob fighting the American Nazi party. Can you maybe speak to that real quick? Let's listen, you know what, we're not in the super rush. You wanna maybe speak to that real quick? So that, that's a, you know what, make it make a separate one for that. We'll do, it, we'll, do, we'll do it, we'll do another one. That is a very historical and very timely because of the rising uh, tide of anti-Semitism in the United States today. Again, this is a very interesting time, uh, a very dangerous time. Yep. And the story of the American Jews, uh, the Jewish mob, beating up the American Nazi party with the cooperation of the Italians. The Italians played a very significant role in helping to supply weapons and arms to both Haganah and to Irgun at a time when it was a criminal act to ship uh, weapons to Palestine to pre-state Israel. Wow. And about that subject, it, it, we should really be talking about those, the, the uh, number one, the the um, uh, con the the uh, the American Jewish the the Jewish mob and their struggles and beating up the American Nazi Party and the silver shirts and the black shirts during uh, the 1930s, both here in the United States and in England. We want to talk about the Operation Underworld, That's where the mob cooperated with the Department of Navy. Uh, and the United States military for the invasion of Sicily yep. uh, during World War II. And we want to talk about, number three, the supplying of weapons and arms and the shipping of weapons and arms to Haganah and to Ergun, to the two militias yep. that helped to create the state of Israel. And then lastly, we want to talk about my own relationship and my activities involved with Simon Wiesenthal, the very famous Nazi hunter. Yeah, I, heard, I read about that when I read your bio. So listen, yep. we're going to set it back up. I don't even care if it's about the mob stuff. I would love to hear about how the relation to the formation of Israel. That was 1948? The, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the actual um, announcement of the, the declaration of the state of Israel took place May 14th, 1948. Yeah, um, if I would have got the day, that would have been crazy. But I know you got the uh, great respect um, uh, for the Jewish people. I have great respect for you. And uh, thank you for being on the Armchair NBA. I really appreciate it, Myron. Tommy, we'll get together. We'll cut up a big bowl of pasta bazool. All right. God bless. Thank you. All the best. God bless you. Thank yeah. you, son.